Hello everybody, I'm KC, and welcome to another edition of Let's Talk About. Today, let's talk about the Sherlock Christmas special, The Abominable Bride. After two years, the wonderful BBC interpretation of The Great Detective returns for the holidays, but with a twist. As most of you already know, this special takes place in the original Victorian setting that the original stories took place in, with the Sherlock cast we've come to know and love. This was quite a change of pace, but I was anxious to see how they pull it off. Let's see how they did. Also, spoilers. The episode actually opens by recreating Holmes and Watson's first meeting in the Victorian setting. This is cool for a couple of reasons. For one, it introduces us to this new world in a familiar way. And two, despite there being so many adaptations of Sherlock Holmes, we almost never get to see their first meeting. So I was very happy to finally see this moment on screen in its original setting. A quick flash forward and we see how fame has affected the lives of Holmes and Watson, so much so that they have to change parts of their appearance to be recognized in public. This was also a scene I really appreciated, especially considering Watson's stories and public opinion on Holmes is a reoccurring theme in this episode. This scene was a preview clip from Comic-Con, and it's what sold me on this special. Not only having the trademark quick humor the show has to offer, but it's very reminiscent of the opening scene from The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, another story that goes into how Watson's publications affect their everyday lives, and one of my favorite Holmes adaptations. Get used to me mentioning previous adaptations of The Great Detective, guys, because it won't be the last time we'll be seeing them. The case of the week for this special concerns a woman who shot herself with dozens of witnesses present and then returns to kill her husband afterwards, which was a scenario that certainly sounded familiar, but we'll go more into that later. Fun fact, while The Abominable Bride is for the most part an original story, the title does tie back to the original stories. In The Musgrave Ritual, a short Holmes adventure I highly recommend, Holmes is showing Watson some records he wrote of his earlier cases before Watson came along, one of which was, and I quote, a full account of Riccoletti of the Clubfoot and his abominable wife. The more you know. The first half pretty much plays out like a traditional Sherlock Holmes television adventure, with some calmer pacing and a more sophisticated vocabulary, not to mention plenty of callbacks. I've mentioned a few examples, but there were a lot more. The Strand looking exactly like the original magazine, the Baker Street Irregular, Holmes calling Watson his Boswell, the list goes on. As a fan of Sherlock Holmes in general, seeing all of these references play so well into the special was great to see. Even the orange pips. Even if they technically already did the pips thing in a different way in the great game. But this was still cool. Not to mention all the actors do a great job working in this new environment. But Holmes and Watson are obviously the standouts here, and they look great. Cumberbatch really pulled off the traditional Holmes look and mannerisms. Then, of course, there's... Whoa. Actually, this was probably the only thing I wasn't a huge fan of in the episode. Yes, I know that Mycroft was a larger gentleman in the original stories, and I was looking forward to seeing them make that change. I'm just not a huge fan of how they presented it. Mycroft was like that because he was lazy, not gluttonous. Maybe it's because I'm not a fan of fat jokes to begin with, but seeing the most powerful man in England scarf down plum puddings was something I didn't really care for. But that's just me. On a side note, I did really like the idea of using sign language in the Diogenes Club. The Diogenes Club has continued to be a place of silence in every adaptation I've seen, so I'm surprised no one has thought of this yet. It's a small touch, but a creative one I really, really liked. But like I said before, for the most part, this plays out like a traditional Sherlock Holmes television adventure. In fact, I'd be willing to bet that there was some inspiration from the Jeremy Brett television series, especially that great chase scene in the Carmichael estate. Sure, it's still gripping and suspenseful, and Riccoletti is pretty scary, but for the most part, it was just a fun and classic Sherlock Holmes mystery. Until this is found on the body of Sir Eustace. Now let's talk about the scene with Moriarty and Holmes' flat. I should point out that this scene happens after Holmes takes a certain 7% solution. I'll admit that this scene was kind of confusing on my first watch through. I was having trouble figuring out what was going on. But that confusion clouded just how great the standoff scene is. Seriously, watch this again and tell me this scene isn't put together amazingly. It certainly showed just how much I missed Moriarty. Even in this Victorian setting, he's just as much as a taunting, despicable snake as he always was. But only Andrew Scott can make such an unnerving character so much fun to watch. Not only is Moriarty unnerving, but so is this whole scene. Yeah, on my first watch through I was confused, but that's because the whole scene gives off this feeling that something isn't right. 
especially by how Holmes clearly has his guard down and is genuinely confused by what's going on around him. This whole scene is tense, but also wonderfully performed by both actors. We'll come back to this in a minute, but right now let's focus on the most important thing to come from this scene. It causes Sherlock to wake up as the plane he was on at the end of season 3 lands back in London. Wait, what? Oh, we're in that kind of story. This dreamlike way of telling the story is my best guess for why first impressions on this episode were so mixed, because it's been pretty solid up to this point. This is a storytelling method that could turn a lot of people off, especially on a first watch through. I'll admit that there are times where I haven't cared for it, since it can get confusing if you don't write it properly, but this is not one of them. When I watched the episode again, I found the twist to be well foreshadowed and the switch between modern and Victorian times to be executed well. Plus, it's a great exploration of Sherlock as a character. How they connected this case to the current storyline is actually pretty clever. Sherlock remembers a case from a hundred years ago that was very similar to the return of Moriarty, so he tries to solve that one to figure out what's going on here. The problem is that he's using more damaging methods to imagine all of this. Sherlock having a history with drugs is something they touched on in his last vow, but it seems like it was more serious than we realized. The fact that he was even willing to use these methods, when there's no evidence that he's done this at least since John came into his life, shows just how desperate he truly is. This gives Sherlock Holmes some very interesting character conflict. It breaks down his barriers and shows his vulnerability, which is something I was very intrigued by, especially considering it doesn't happen that often, even in other adaptations without being Mr. Holmes, because he's older and that's cheating. There are small moments of true vulnerability from Holmes, like that famous moment from the story of the Three Garadibs, Holmes's past love life and the private life, and there is a moment in the Jeremy Brett special, The Eligible Bachelor, where Holmes admits that he regrets Moriarty's death. But this scene is literally a minute long and doesn't really go anywhere after that, but that moment brings up something important. Holmes as a character has always been challenged by Moriarty, and this may be the greatest challenge the Napoleon of Crime has ever confronted him with. But Sherlock isn't thrilled by the mystery of Moriarty's return, he's haunted by it. Unlike almost every other case he's had, Moriarty died right in front of him, and he doesn't see any possible way he could have survived. This special shows just how far Sherlock is willing to go to find a solution, and hopefully his reasonings for using such damaging methods is something we'll go more into in Season 4. Not only was I surprised to see Sherlock Holmes reach such a low point and attempt such drastic measures, but I was genuinely surprised at how concerned Mycroft was. Mycroft has been portrayed as less caring and trustworthy in this adaptation, basically as a powerful man in the British government first, and Sherlock's brother second. But from the second he says on the plane, oh Sherlock, he is in full big brother mode. Which not only shows how badly Sherlock is damaging himself right now, but how much Mycroft really does care about his brother. I know this was something touched on in season 3, but it was nothing compared to this. Mark Gatiss' performance shows this better than anything. Just sitting there with a much calmer tone, saying that he will be there for Sherlock. I never thought I'd see the day where Mycroft was portrayed as caring. This whole situation also gives us a sense that these two have a past. I know this is a weird thing to say because they're brothers, of course they have a past, but I mean a past with a presence, of past experiences that are helped or hurt their relationship and themselves, things that only they know about each other. Again, this is something that is touched on in small moments in other adaptations, but nothing quite like this to my knowledge. These are all wonderful themes that I hope are expanded on in the episodes to come, but for now, let's go back to the case of the Abominable Bride. Back in the Victorian setting, Holmes, with Mary's help, discovers who was behind the Abominable Bride. Okay, some people have called this solution sexist. My best guess as to why is because these women created the Abominable Bride to right the wrongs that women have been under for years. So I guess some people think that this is saying that feminists are bad or something? And I honestly have to disagree, for three reasons. One. This episode goes out of its way to say that the fight for women's rights is one that should be won. Mycroft even says that there is a war in England that it should lose. Later, during the reveal, Holmes says that women have had great injustice in being denied basic rights. 2. Just because these women were seen as fighting for a just cause, that doesn't mean that their actions are justified. Because there certainly aren't extreme or negative ways of fighting for a good cause, are there? 
almost every cause has people who are either standing up for it for the wrong reasons or aren't going about it the right way, which in turn makes the cause look bad. But I will admit that if all the women in the special were part of this group, then maybe I could see what some people are saying, but they aren't. Three, there are positive female characters in this special who believe in the same rights these women do, but have much better ways of going about it. Mrs. Hudson gets mad at Watson for not giving her more to do in his stories and wants some more inclusion, in a way, looking for more positive female representation in media. Mary is not only a suffragette, but helps people who recognize her skills. Why does Mary work for Mycroft? I don't know. I don't care. It's freaking cool. Mary is ten times more interesting than she ever was in the books or any adaptation I've ever seen. This not only goes for this special, but for the show Sherlock in general. I actually really like the idea of showing that there are dark sides to good causes, even if the reveal was a bit too theatrical. And like the empty hearse, this scene gives you a plausible explanation for how Riccoletti survived and how the other murders were committed, but not one you have to accept. It's all up to the viewer. But the reason Sherlock is going through all of this is to find out how Moriarty survived. While I think the explanation for Riccoletti's return was a plausible one, it does not, however, apply to Moriarty. Watch the scene where Moriarty shoots himself in the Reichenbach fall again, and you can see that these two scenarios are completely different. Maybe if Moriarty was standing in front of the doorway to the roof and fell down the stairs, it would be a little likely. But as it stands, these are two completely different incidents. If anything, it proves that Moriarty can't possibly be backed when he died right in front of England's greatest detective. So this episode is pretty much dedicated to saying that there is no way Moriarty survived, which I am personally okay with, since I didn't see any plausible way he could be alive either. But there's still one more scene to talk about, the final confrontation at the Reichenbach Falls. I cannot tell you how excited I was when the camera zoomed out to reveal the falls for the very first time. This is my personal favorite scene in the episode, though that may be for biased reasons. It's one of the few times I've seen this confrontation actually look like a fight next to a waterfall, with the actors being soaked and slipping on the rocks as they fight. There's this one shot that looks exactly like the famous illustration from The Final Problem, which was such an amazing touch. Then, of course, there's Watson's appearance. See, Moriarty is a villain Sherlock always ends up facing alone. Watson may come along for the ride, but the final confrontation usually just comes down to these two great minds. Not just in the book, but in almost any adaptation you look at, including Sherlock. But seeing Watson suddenly show up, able to finally be there for Sherlock in his darkest hour, and help him defeat his greatest foe in their most famous battle, was something truly wonderful to see. And that moment where Watson pushes Moriarty into the falls and says it was his turn was perfect, and maybe one of my favorite moments in Sherlock as a whole. I don't care if it was a hallucination, it was great. Sherlock comes out of this experience knowing that while Moriarty might be dead, something else is going on, and he knows exactly what to do about it. Overall, I thought this special was great. Sure, it's not perfect, and I guess I understand why some people don't like it, since it pretty much spits in the face of anyone who thought Moriarty was still alive, but to someone like me who is a huge Sherlock Holmes fan who did not think Moriarty survived, this special has a lot to offer. The callbacks are numerous, but never feel like pandering, the atmosphere during the Victorian scenes is wonderful while mixing in the same Sherlock production values, the actors continue to impress, and the characters are all fun to watch, well represented, and some are even explored deeper in ways I've wanted to see for a very long time. This is one of my favorite episodes and I look forward to watching it over and over. Not to mention it got me hyped for what's to come in season 4, which can't be very far behind after this episode, so join me again when I talk about Sherlock season 4 in... Oh, come on!